When you think of whisky, you think of Scotland. Clean air, fresh water, fields of barley and smoky peat. For centuries, it's been the heartland of whisky distilling, but no more. On the opposite side and at the bottom end of the world, the Scots have a rival, Tasmania. In 25 years, the whisky business in my home state has gone from nothing to now producing the best single malt in the world. That's an achievement worth drinking to. In moderation, of course. There's always something enchanting about the Scottish Highlands. Walking through the barley, I'm amazed at the beauty of the place. But in reality, this field is much more than just a pretty picture. The barley from here is used in Scotland's multi-billion dollar industry, whisky making. Whisky is Scotland's most potent symbol and, after oil, its biggest export earner. Now, this is what I'm looking for, a nice little stream, or, as they'd say in Scotland, a wee barn. And they say that you can only make the best whisky from water like this. It's come from soft rain and it's scented by the heather as it flows. It's all very romantic, but the fact is, this little stream isn't in the Scottish Highlands. It's on the other side of the world, at the bottom of the earth, in the Tasmanian Highlands. And the water tastes beautiful. But I can't wait until I make it into something just a little bit stronger. My argument is that Tasmania is a counterfeit Scotland. Well, I think many people could be forgiven for thinking we're here in Scotland. It was this uncanny likeness to Scotland that one day, 25 years ago, excited a Tasmanian surveyor, Bill Lark. He was fly fishing in the highlands of Tasmania and he had what he calls his epiphany. What was going through your mind? Well, a fair bit of whiskey. <laughs> we knew there was good barley growing around the area. The water speaks for itself. And we knew there were peat bogs up in the highlands. We thought the climate surely must be right for making whiskey. And it was just one of those funny things. Um, we said it to ourselves, I wonder why somebody's not making whiskey. Without knowing where it might lead, Bill Lark had dreamed up a great idea because over in Scotland... Hot water comes in here and all the grist... They can't keep up with the worldwide demand for their whisky. I discovered this sobering fact when I met Ian Miller, the marketing boss at the famous Glenfiddich distillery. Every second, uh, 38 bottles of whisky are sold around the world. Every second? Yep, and right now there isn't enough whisky um, being produced in Scotland to satisfy all of the markets around the world. It never stops. It's 24-7. It's a whisky 24 factory. 24-7, 48, 49 weeks production per year. Dufftown is the whisky capital of Scotland. And for centuries, the nearby Glenfiddich distillery has claimed to be the drop against which all others might be judged. That first cork that you take off, that first burst of air that, that explodes out of the top of the bottle, that's Dufftown air, that's from this village. And people have a, a, a real sense of pride. And pride makes a difference to people when, they, when they're working because that sense of pride jacks up the attention to detail. Uh, that you can't get from someone who's just earning a wage. You'll find that same enthusiasm 17,000 kilometres away in Tasmania with Bill Lark, who's turned the same passion into reality at his Lark distillery. I never considered myself a businessman. Um, we've just found ourselves in a situation where we, where we learned how to make whisky. He surrounded himself at Lark with family and friends including former English teacher turned chief whisky taster and peat bog expert, Mark Nicholson. Yeah, it's like wet hairy chocolate. Mark is giving me a quick lesson in the digging of peat in the Tasmanian Highlands. Oh, that's nice. nice peat. This decayed vegetation was used by the Scots as an ancient form of heating. In whisky, it's burnt to smoke the barley. Nothing until you burn it. When you burn it, it smells like whisky. <laughs> Under the barley, the peat smoke gets infused into the barley and gives us that beautiful smoky 
um, herby, almost an incense, uh, uh, aromatic character to the whiskey. So uh, I love it when you talk like that. <laughs> you love it when I talk dirty. <laughs> <laughs> there is a romance, and you do talk the talk, don't you, you blokes? Well, there's a marvelous romance in whiskey making, and you know, 600 years of of, of romance in, in in Scotland, and we're only just getting onto it here. And the romance is contagious. Across the Tasmanian landscape, the Lark has been joined by nearly 20 other distilleries. Single malt whiskey's been growing strongly between 12 and 19% per annum ever since, right through the global financial crisis. Nobody stopped drinking malt whiskey. Now you're really a boutique industry. Give me a comparison with, say, Glenfiddich. That um, any one time, they've never got less than 1 million 200 litre barrels of whiskey maturing away. That's a lot of whiskey. Um, a distillery like Lark Distillery would probably have, at any one time, 2,000 barrels sitting in its bond stores. Now this is my peat. This is your peat, Charles. You did so well digging it. At Lark sits small scale in a tiny oven. The peat down on the bottom shelf and the barley on the shelves above. It's boutique whiskey making. But back at Glenfiddich, the scale is industrial. The whole idea is that we, we're just creating smoke in here. The peat smoking process takes up an entire building. This is how it gets into the barley. That's how we infuse it. Two flights of stairs above, a cavernous interior. This is? And a sea of barley. So the peat that I put in down below is burning up through That's here. It's burning up through here right through now. The... So you can actually see the floor. Oh, the floor is totally porous. Yeah. So it allows the, the warm air to come up, but it doesn't allow the, the barley to, to fall down through it. Well, yeah. that's enough of the secret alchemy of whiskey making. Let's get down to the very important and much more enjoyable part of tasting it. Whiskey is a seductive drink, and so the tasting is sensitively done. But warming from the hand. Surprisingly, I spluttered through a lot of it with Scottish whisky expert Charles McLean. It's very, it's very spicy. Oh. Mm. That's a real, you know, <laughs> man's whisky. Oh, oh, that's good. Um, <laughs> even the nosing, as they call it here, made me cough. That's fierce. Ooh, it's quite. It's got. A, that's got the, the, the first thing you measure, if you like, is the, what's called the nose feed effect. This is quite prickly. Charles is Scotland's leading spiritual guide in these matters. The Lark from Tasmania. Oh, and so yeah, it was yeah, important yeah. to get his approval of Lark's Tasmanian whiskey. Is it, like Tasmania, a convincing counterfeit? Is it good? Longer. It's very good indeed. Very nice. Easy drink. Well done, Bill, if you're watching. Well, of course, you can't argue with success, which was most eloquently expressed two years ago when a bottle of Tasmania Sullivan's Cove, distilled by Bill Lark, a good sense of oh, oh, yeah. won the world's <laughs> best single great. malt whiskey yeah. prize, beating the Scots at their own game on their home ground. It's good for, for Scotland to actually see that, that our whisky is outside of Scotland performing well. So you're not irritated by this? And we're still growing at 4-5% per year. Uh, and uh, Glenfiddich is growing ahead of the category. So as long as that continues, we're quite happy to see other players coming in and making their own whiskey. Um, remember, we've been doing this for three, four hundred years, so we've got a head You've start. You've got to get good at it. We've got a head start. We, we're, we're getting pretty good at it. So. <laughs> uh, it'd be great to get another paddy to bottle in, won't it? It will. Keep the boys busy in the distillery. It's fair to say that part of Bill Lark's success lies largely in real-life romance. His brave idea of copying the Scots at what they do best would never have become reality without the encouragement and guidance of Lynn Lark, Bill's wife of 42 years. Although it's a romantic business, it's also a business and it's about money. Who's got the head for money here? Oh, definitely Lynn. <laughs> I'm the figures girl, so um, yeah. So do you need and to keep him under control oh, occasionally? God, yes. <laughs> <laughs> He's terrible. <laughs> He's, he's, I always called him, when we, even when we first knew each other, he was hopeless. <laughs> I used to call him the two dollar man, he'd have two bucks in his pocket and he was a millionaire. That's it. <laughs> in Scotland, whisky making is worth seven billion dollars a year. The Tasmanian industry, worth just 25 million, isn't a threat. Well, not yet. 
Charles. Please be my guest. Oh, thank you very much. What sort of egomaniac puts his own name on a bottle of whiskey? Well, Johnny Walker. <laughs> Blake named McCallum. <laughs> That's beautiful. Down home in Tasmania, Bill Lark has been heralded as the godfather of the Australian whiskey industry. But I prefer to think of him more as a jovial Santa Claus who has bestowed on his home state a marvellous gift that just keeps on giving. Slonger. Slonger. You get a kick out of being the face of the Australian whiskey industry, don't you? <laughs> I actually don't mind it. I'm very proud of what Lynn and I have started and the industry that's followed along with us. Um, we're all good mates. We all work together really well. Uh, that, that really tickles me that um, we've created an industry by collaboration and um, being good friends, good mates, part of the bigger family.